The Calling of St. Matthew is an oil painting on canvas by Caravaggio completed in 1600 depicting a story from the Gospel of Matthew. In the years following, Caravaggio would reach notable fame as a painter in Rome and infamy as a sword-wielding outlaw eventually fleeing to Naples, and in 10 years he would be dead at the age of 38. Throughout this video I'm going to be talking more about Caravaggio's biography, but for now we're going to focus on the painting and a few of his techniques. Now the painting that we're looking at today illustrates a scene in which Jesus calls on Matthew to follow him as an apostle, painted in Caravaggio's signature tenebrism style. Tenebrism is derived from the Italian tenebroso, meaning dark and gloomy. Commonly used in Baroque paintings, tenebrism was developed to add drama and a sense of urgency to the artwork by adding high contrasts of values while sometimes including a spotlight effect as seen in The Calling of St. Matthew. So for our copy, we're going to be doing one small section of this painting cropped out. On the screen now is my completed version, and I finished this pretty quickly in less than a week, and you know, it's not perfect, I'm no Caravaggio, but it's a good demonstration of what we're trying to achieve. Now I chose a very specific size for this painting at 24 inches in height by 30 inches in length. At this size, this painting is almost the exact same dimensions of the cropped version of The Calling of St. Matthew. So for dimensions, this is a one-to-one -one scale copy. Up on the screen now is the cropped version that I used as a reference. So if you'd like to copy this one and paint along with me, feel free to pause the video here to use this as your guide. For this painting, I'm going to be using an airbrush and acrylic paints. The airbrush I'm using is an Iwata Micron Takumi, and I'm also using Createx Illustration Colors. And throughout this whole painting, I'll be spraying at 20 PSI. You can use any type of airbrush you want for this, any kind will do just fine, just make sure it's a double action. And since we're going to be including a lot of erasing and negative techniques, I recommend that you get a good erasable acrylic paint. Createx Illustration Colors is the best in my opinion, followed by Comart Paints. So let's move along to the mixing table and start mixing our first color. I never mix colors within my airbrush, I always do this separately, so here I'm using some one ounce cups and starting with about 25 drops of burnt umber. Burnt umber is kind of a dark orange, so I want to shift that toward red, so I'm adding about seven drops of scarlet. These are Createx Illustration colors, and right out of the bottle, they're just a little bit too thick to be spraying through a micron, so I add about 10-15 drops of distilled water. This color is going to be used for the base flesh tones, but right now you're going to see this is way too red. Um, I'm going to add some more colors to this later on, but I just want to show you what this looks like right now, so if you're following along, you get more of a sense of, of where I'm going with this. So at the point right now, you can see it's a very deep red, almost maroon color. So to knock out some of that red, we're going to use a complement, which is green. So I'm adding about two, three drops of cobalt blue, and then of course some yellow. The pigment in yellow is a lot weaker than the blue, so I'm adding about six, seven drops of some yellow into this. After mixing this color up really well on the mini vortex mixer, you're going to see that the color we get is kind of this dark muted brown, and this is going to be a perfect starting point for our flesh tones. The hue is still going to be in that dark orange reddish range, but you can see here that this color is much muted than our original mixture. To help us achieve some of those dark earth tones that we see in most of Caravaggio's paintings, we're also going to be using sepia, some burnt umber, black, and later on some scarlet. I don't want to overcomplicate anything within this lesson, so those are going to be the only colors that we're going to be using throughout this whole painting. I sketched in my initial lines and contour drawings using a 2H pencil made by Tombow, and I also used a grid of 1 inch by 2 inch. For me, once my initial drawing is set up, I don't need a grid anymore, so I usually erase it, but this time I decided to leave it in, so if some of you are painting along with me, you may find this helpful. So with all that out of the way, let's get right into the painting. The color I'm starting with is the color that we just mixed, and I usually like to start with the eyes, so I'm starting with the left one. The color that we mix for the flesh tone is going to be 100% transparent, meaning that there's no white added to the mixture. So all of our values are going to be adjusted by how much paint we apply to the canvas. So although we're mimicking the end results of Caravaggio's techniques, our style of painting is going to be completely different. For one thing, I don't believe any Baroque artist would ever start by painting on a white canvas they would always tint it with a kind of an earth tone before going into the actual painting. And of course all of the highlights would be added with opaque colors, usually mixed with lead white. But for us we're going to be going in the opposite direction. To get highlights we're going to be removing paint, so our bright areas are actually going to come from that white canvas underneath. If you're new to this style of painting and have no idea what I'm talking about, you'll understand later as we go further into the painting. So the first thing I did was use some rip sheets of paper and some airbrush shields that I made myself just to kind of start putting in this dark cast shadow on the left side of the nose and the upper part of these eyeglasses. 
we're going to have to switch these later to some cooler tones, maybe using some black or some sepia. But for now, it's nice to stick with that one color, the flesh tone that we mixed. And this way, while we're working on our painting, we're only focusing on the values, where the darks are and where the lights are. This way, we're not getting overwhelmed by switching to different paints and switching to different colors. So what I'm trying to do here is look at my reference photo from Caravaggio's painting and try to see where these really dark shadows are and start mapping them in with the airbrush. At this stage, I don't mind if it's messy that's not going to hurt me because later on I could start cleaning these up either using my eraser or switching to a darker paint and kind of putting them in place. So let's put up Caravaggio's painting on the left side of the screen so that we can compare our work to it and see how far we need to push our values to reach that end result. There's a few difficulties I came across while trying to copy this and the first is the photo reference. For my reference, I use the photo from the Calling of St. Matthew Wikipedia page, which is a large high-res photo. When using reference photos that someone else took, it's impossible to tell what the white balance is, so it's hard to tell if the colors are correct or if even if the values are correct. And also Caravaggio's painting is over 400 years old, so that means the paint is chipping and cracking, there's different layers of varnish on it, and I'm sure some art restorers worked on it. And it's also very likely that Caravaggio used walnut oil as his binder within his paint, because that was very very common in the late Renaissance and early Baroque period along with linseed oil and those two binders tend to yellow over time. So just understand that by no means am I trying to create a perfect replica or copy based off the original. We're just doing the best we can to study from his paintings. From here, I'm using my skin texture template to lightly spray in some of the textures underneath the eye and just above the brow ridge. You could see that in the reference photo on the left side of the screen that there's a lot of texture going on in the skin. Now, in my opinion, this is most likely paint that's chipping or cracking. I've been to Rome, but unfortunately I haven't seen the Calling of St. Matthew in person. I've seen a lot of Renaissance and Baroque paintings, especially here in New York at the Met. And I would say that the majority of them have a subtle cracking of the paint across the whole surface. And if you take a photo of this and look at it from a distance, it could look like skin texture. But the goal here is to do the best I can to paint what I see. So if I see some texture, I'm going to do the best I can to try to replicate it. At this point, we've only been using one color, and you can see that in the shadows of of the orbits where the eye sockets are that the color is way too red that's fine we'll adjust it we'll shift that color temperature to a cooler tone later on but for now as long as we kind of block in these large masses of value it'll help us understand where we need to go I'm trying to go very slowly with my paint and slowly build up the values because any transparent color can get dark really really quickly if you spray too much of it so I always want to stay light here knowing that I could erase into it later start pulling out some texture and understand that if I want to go dark later on and commit more paint to it, I can. But if I go too dark with my paintings, unlike oil painting, I can't just lighten them up because with airbrushing and opaque paints, we start getting that blue-gray shift, which I'll talk about later on in this video, and that just adds too many complications to it that I don't want to deal with. For those of you who never used an airbrush before, what I'm doing here is using a shield made out of mylar. And the purpose of this is to give me sharp, clean lines. In oil painting, you naturally get a sharp, clean line just by painting with a brush. But with an airbrush, you naturally get a soft line, so you need some tools to help you sharpen it. And in oil painting, since you naturally get a sharp line, you need some tools like some large, fluffy brushes to help soften it. If I'm going over too much information too quickly, I apologize for that, but I need to do my best to try to compress all this information so that this video is not 10, 15 hours long, which nobody wants to watch. From here, I'm just using my airbrush freehand to define some of the features on the left side of his face, like the nasal bone and a few of the wrinkles here just above the eye. Now when painting freehand like this, your lines are always going to be too soft, but later on I'm going to use some erasers to help sharpen and clean them up. In the initial stages of any airbrush painting, it's fine to just paint freehand. You could almost think of that as a traditional underpainting, and then from there you can go on and start defining things. And this leads us into talking about a few of the major differences between modern painting using airbrushes and acrylic paint, and traditional late renaissance, early baroque paintings using oil paint. The first major difference is that all early Baroque painters would tint their canvases with kind of like a brownish muted earth tone before adding the other values. From there they could start adding the darks with some darker values and then start using some lighter opaque colors with lead white to add in the highlights. And most of these painters would have included a step called the dead layer which is technically like a grisaille where they would paint the whole image almost in like a black and white in all muted colors just to focus on those values. 
from there what they could do is use transparent glazes over the top of different hues meaning different colors to shift the color to what they want for the final painting I'm well aware that I'm almost offensively simplifying this, but maybe in the future we'll have to do another version of a traditional painting using classic techniques and oil paint. Underneath this left eye where the eyeglasses are, you can see that as I'm using a shield, it doesn't fit perfectly around the curve of it. So what I'm doing is constantly moving it and I'm just spraying in a small section. This way, as I spray in little bits around, I can get the correct shape. If you'd like to use something like 3M vinyl tape or some frisket film, that'll work just fine too. The only problem with that is that it's really easy to spray too dark and then when you remove that tape or the frisket film, it almost looks like a, a sticker or a stencil was placed on there. So you just have to be careful using that I think it's best in the beginning to focus on some soft areas that aren't that defined because later on if you want to define them you can using those tools I feel pretty comfortable where I'm at right now I can see that most of these shapes or blocks of value are in the correct places I just want to add some more paint just above the eye on the forehead and I just want to remind you that this whole time we've just been using that one color that we mixed in the beginning of the video we're gonna to switch to another one once we feel like we're confident that these are in the correct places at this point, I decided to stop, take a break for about 10 minutes, and when I come back, I'm going to switch to a different color, and in this case, we're going to be using sepia to darken some of these values. So the sepia in the airbrush right now is going to do two things. One, it's going to darken all these values, so I'm going to lightly spray it over any of the areas where the cast shadows are. And the second thing it's going to do is it's going to shift the temperature of these shadows from that warm orange red color that we have for the flesh tone to a cooler tone. The hue is still going to be in that range of a brown color, but this time it's going to be slightly cooler. It'll look more natural in the shadows. This sepia color is also going to work perfect for the glasses, so while I have it in the airbrush, I'm going to go around with my shield just like I did before and lightly spray it over the edges of these glasses to darken them up. While I'm doing this, I'm also spraying a little bit heavier, so not only are they darkening them, but I'm also sharpening the outlines around them. When I'm painting with an airbrush, I always like to keep the PSI right around 20, so somewhere in between 18 to 22, anywhere in that range, should work just fine for anyone. In the manual that comes along with the Iwata Micron, it recommends spraying at 12 to 15 psi and in my opinion that's just way too low of a number that'll work really great if you're spraying something that has a consistency that's similar to water like dyes that don't have pigments in them but if you're using an acrylic paint that has finely ground pigments in it that number is way too low and you're just not going to get good control with it so i always recommend bumping that up to at least 20 psi you could even go higher up to 25 psi but it's up to you to decide which pressure is the best for you to spray it i've heard a lot of people say that the lower the number the more control you have and that's only true if you're using basically watercolors or um, like food dyes something that doesn't have pigments in it if you're using an acrylic paint that lower number is gonna hurt you so going back to the painting you could see now that I switched over to an eraser now this is an aggressive eraser this is technically a sand or an ink eraser made by Faber-Castell so unlike Caravaggio where he's using opaque paints to add in his highlights we're using erasing techniques to erase into the paint to expose some of that white gessoed canvas underneath to give us our highlights the main reason I do this is to avoid that odd color shift that we get when spraying opaque paints through an airbrush and another great reason is that you get a lot of control when you're using a stick or pencil eraser like this because it's basically like using a pencil and the edge of it comes to a nice fine point so you can get in there and add a lot of detail where you need it. It's important to note that you can control how much paint you remove or how bright the highlight is by how much pressure you use. So if I use a lot of pressure I'm basically pulling out all the paint and I'm gonna get a pure bright white highlight but if I want to get a you know a more subtle or a softer highlight I could use less pressure so you get a lot of control with this you could actually choose what value you want just by how much pressure you use on your eraser and while we're removing paint more of that white canvas is gonna show through so what's happening here is that these two colors are optically mixing so the value is gonna be lighter it's gonna look like a brighter color but we're still gonna retain that exact same hue one of the reasons I love using this technique so much is that you basically have to mix a few different colors. You don't have to mix a bunch of different light opaques to lay on top of each other. All you have to do is lay down that initial flesh tone and then erase into it to get your highlights. And then of course, if you want that flesh tone darker, you just spray more paint. And if you wanna shift the color temperature, then we'll use a cooler tone like sepia or black. 
So let's put the reference photo back up on the left side of the screen. And what I'm gonna do now is use my eraser to start pulling out some highlights on this cheek. For this area and for a basic skin texture, what I'm doing is I'm erasing in very small circular motions with this eraser. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna basically give us a very subtle texture that almost looks like skin pores. In the Caravaggio paintings I've seen in real life, I've never seen him actually paint skin pores on it. So this is most likely a subtle cracking of the paint, but since I see it in that reference, I'm going to try to replicate it. When you're erasing out highlights on an airbrush painting like I did here, generally they erase out too light. And this is a good thing. This is always what you want in your painting because what's going to happen now is we're going to switch back over to our color. I'm going to put some of that flesh tone in the airbrush and lightly spray this over the top. Now, since this color is transparent, this is considered a glaze, a light dusting of this paint over the area that we just erased into, and it's going to darken it up. And since this color is transparent, we're not going to lose any of that texture that we added in with the eraser. All we're going to do is get a darker version of it as we spray on top. The glazing technique of using transparent paint over your opaque paints dates back to the Renaissance and it was used by many artists from the 1500s all the way up till today. And traditionally it was of course painted in oil paints. And it works wonderfully when you're painting in oils. The only problem with it is that oil paints are very slow to dry. So as you add a glaze, you're going to have to wait for at least a day for that to kind of tack up before you get add another layer on top of it. But with acrylic paints, we eliminate that problem. Since they dry so quickly, we could add glazes every few minutes. So while I'm painting here, you can see I'm mostly painting freehand and using an eraser, but right here I'm using a ripped piece of paper just to define in that wrinkle on the forehead. On the left side of his face, you can see that there's a dark cast shadow and then some reflected light right here underneath the, uh, the dark cast shadow. So I'm just adding that in with this same flesh tone. Of course, this is going to be way too light and the color is going to be too red, but I'm going to switch over to some sepia next and we'll apply that over the top of it. If you're going for a dark color, it's always best to start with your flesh tone, your initial one that you mix and basically spray that until you get it as dark as you can and then once that's set in then switch over to either black or sepia to spray on top so that's exactly what I did here I'm now using sepia in the airbrush and I dilute this with a few drops of water and I'm starting on the left side here just kind of mapping in some of this hair while I'm painting hair I'm never actually thinking of painting individual hairs what I'm doing is painting in the shadows so this color works perfectly to kind of map them in and place in the large blocks of shadows which are always going to be next to highlights. So moving along to the right eye, most of it's really dark. So I'm just going to use a sepia right now to kind of map out the major areas of it where these really dark shadows are. And I can see there's some red in the middle there where the eyelid's coming over the eye. So I'll switch over to our flesh tone later and spray that on the top. So you can see right now I just left it blank. So pure white for now. And for the next 15 or 20 minutes, all I did was keep the sepia in my airbrush and constantly look back at the reference photo from the original Caravaggio painting and start adding that sepia in areas where it looks like it should be darker. So mainly you can see the right side of the hair and then behind it where we're gonna need a bit of a shadow where that background's eventually gonna be. And also mainly on the left side of this face, the cast shadow on the left side of the nose and also these big shadows underneath the left eye. So at this point, we've been using only two colors. The first one was the flesh tone that we mixed in the beginning of the video and the second was just sepia directly out of the bottle. And our skin tones aren't perfect. They're not exactly the same as Caravaggio's, but they're pretty close. So it's nice to understand that you can go pretty far with just using a very limited palette to get pretty realistic or accurate looking flesh tones. And this goes back to the idea that the most important thing in any painting, whether it's a portrait or a still life, is accurate values. Now, when I say values, I'm talking about how dark and how light something is. So in traditional oil painting during the late Renaissance and early Baroque period, artists like Caravaggio would usually include something called a dead layer, like I mentioned before. And the purpose of a dead layer was basically a grisaille, which means a black and white drawing or painting of everything within the portrait so they could really just focus on where the darks are and where the lights are. So although we're not actually painting a grisaille or a dead layer, we're actually doing a very similar thing just by starting with that original flesh tone and painting as much as the portrait as we can. When we're using one color, we're really achieving the same thing that a dead layer sets out to do. It's basically just to focus in on all your values. 
So while I continue to work on this painting in the background, I just would like to talk a little bit about Caravaggio and about this painting. And while I'm talking about this, I'm going to try to keep it as informal as I possibly can. I just, I don't want this to sound like a lecture. Caravaggio was born in 1571 in Milan, which is just north of Rome. And in Rome, that's where he would find fame and uh, really make a name for himself. During his teenage and adolescent years, he studied with an artist named Peter Zano, and uh, very little is known about actually what happened during this time. There's there's no real uh, specific information on it, so I'm not going to speculate, but it's obvious that he clearly learned how to paint during this time and how to mix paint. Whether or not he learned how to paint frescoes or, or draw in graphite or charcoal is unknown. So in the early 1590s, around 1592, he moved down to Rome, and the reason for this was to try to make a name for himself as a painter. And I think we could all understand what this is like. These people do this all the time today, even in the United States. You know, they move to Hollywood to try to become a director or an actor, or even meet with a famous record producer and try to get a record deal. So Caravaggio was essentially trying to do the same thing, only instead of music or film, he was trying to be a painter. And the powerful person who would have hired him would have been someone high up in the Catholic Church, usually a bishop or a cardinal. And for the first five or six years while he was in Rome, he painted a lot of really interesting paintings, very different than his later work which was essentially from patronage uh, for the Catholic Church basically scenes from the Bible from the New Testament but these early paintings caught the attention of people with money mainly people within the Catholic Church like bishops and cardinals two of my favorite Caravaggio paintings from this period are the card sharps and the fortune teller both of these paintings became extremely popular very quickly and they attracted someone named Cardinal Del Monte now Cardinal Del Monte was a big art collector and who's big advocate of the arts and he was one of the main people that allowed Caravaggio to start seeking these large contracts and the first of which was um, the calling of St. Matthew the painting that we're copying right now so this painting the calling of St. Matthew along with another one called the martyrdom of St. Matthew were really what made Caravaggio famous both of these paintings were commissioned to Caravaggio under the recommendation of Cardinal Del Monte and the purpose of both was to decorate the Contarelli chapel it was basically one on each side of the altar and after these paintings were complete in around the year 1600 Caravaggio's name rose to fame and people came from all over Italy to come see these paintings and he was considered the greatest painter of Rome you could actually still see these paintings today they're hung in the exact same place they were over 400 years years ago in the Contarelli Chapel in Rome and there's also another one um, in front right in between the two and that one is called the inspiration of St. Matthew painted about a year or two after the original ones so I'll go into some more information about this in next week's video but for now let's get back to the painting so going back to this man who's most likely another tax collector because that's what St. Matthew was you can see on the left side he has kind of like this furry fluffy coat and basically what this is is hair so if you watched a tutorial I released a few weeks ago showing you how to paint hair I'm really using all those same techniques for this. I started out by spraying in the values with sepia before and I just laid those in so I'd have something to erase or scratch into. From there, I'm just using an eraser to pull out sharp highlights to look like hair. Now, I'm not using a razor blade or an X-Acto blade here because that would be way too sharp. You could see that these hairs are kind of soft and kind of blurry in the background. So the uh, eraser or the pencil eraser really works perfect for this. After I had those scratched in, you could see I just used some burnt umber and some sepia, one or the other, and just glaze those colors on top. You can kind of play around with them, look at the reference photo, see where the darker areas are, and just apply more paint. If you want the color to look more toward the reddish side, go with the burnt umber. And if you want it looking a little bit cooler, a little bit more neutral, then use the sepia. I mixed the two. I used burnt umber in some areas and sepia in some others. And you can see we get a, a pretty good looking effect here that, that almost looks like a, a furry coat. So the last part we're going to have to work on here is this hand that he's using to hold up his glasses. If you're new to painting and haven't approached this before, hands are actually very difficult to paint. They seem like they'd be an easy thing, but they're not. They're very tricky and very unforgiving. If you get one little area off, it's going to make the whole hand or the fingers look completely wrong. So what I did with this is you could see that I left some of my grid lines in there. This way it's going to help me out. Just in case I get lost, I could look at my reference that has some grid marks on it and I can kind of it'll kind of guide me back to to where I need to go. But the color I'm starting with is just like everything else. I'm starting with that flesh tone that we mixed in the beginning, and I just want to work on one finger at a time and then work my way down. Each section I finish is going to be a reference for the next section I work on. 
I'm defining some of the lines around the fingers and the hand itself with some shields. But as you can see in that background, I'm not going that dark just yet because if I got some of those wrong, I could erase into it and I'll be fine. I know that area is gonna have to be very dark, but for now, just like every other thing that we do, try to keep it light and when we're comfortable and happy with it, then we can commit more paint and make it darker. So now that this first finger is in, it still needs a lot of work. It'll give me a sense of where I need to go with my next one. Basically, the values I'll need to add on the next finger. I set my dark cast shadow right here. So I'm going to try to add the next cast shadow under this finger to a very similar value. I don't have to get it perfect right away. I just want to kind of get it close to have all of these fingers looking pretty similar before I switch over to an eraser to pull out some of those really bright highlights that we see in Caravaggio's work. In that traditional tenebrism style, which was basically the next step from chiaroscuro, which was very popular during the Renaissance, what we're getting is a very high contrast between darks and lights. Now, in order for anything to look light, we need to have dark values next to it. So when I'm going to pull out some highlights on these fingers, I want to make sure that the area that's in shadow or in cast shadow to the left of it is dark enough. Remember that all we're ever doing in painting is creating an illusion. So if we want to create that illusion of light, the way that we go about achieving it is we need to have dark values right next to those highlights to create that effect. Without those dark values, your highlights will never look bright. So with that said, this is where we're going to stop for this week's video. There's a lot more to talk about on the hand, so I want to reserve that for the beginning of next week's video, which is going to be up early to mid next week. So if you're painting along with me or trying to practice this one, see if you can get those hands painted in yourself, because next week I'm going to go into a lot more detail about what I did to, uh, to get them looking the way I did. Even in this area that we have right now, this section, these aren't fully complete yet. I'm still going to add some more highlights to them, but everything has to be slow. We can't just rush to the end. We have to take it one step at a time. All right, so that's going to do it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something during this one, and I really hope to see you back early next week for the second and final part of this video. So take care, have a great weekend, and I'll see you then.